have you always been uh, a knowledge junkie, uh, or have psychedelics increased uh, your uh, enthusiasm for learning or the capacity for it? I've always been sort of a knowledge freak. I mean, I was a very weird kid. <laughs> I, I knew I was weird when it was happening, but now that I have a 15-year-old son and watch how he does it, I realized how absolutely weird I was and how alarming I must have been to my parents. <laughs> and um, I was I was not socially adaptable at all because I had bad eyes and poor coordination and I was very easily intimidated and uh, like you know the story of my uh, early schooling was in a town of only 1200 people I was able to find 1700 different ways to get from school to my house in order to avoid being pounced upon by roving cannibal bands of my peers <laughs> who had sworn to get me and they never got me it was astonishing and no no this was some cow town in western colorado and the other thing I discovered early on, and maybe this is too psychotherapeutic to waste time on, was but that I could hold them at bay with story. And essentially I became like the, the king's jester, you know. I became, and then I could hang out with these lumbering, lumpen people because <laughs> I, I was always willing to verbally outrage and say crazy things. I mean, like one of my th things that really got me a lot of points with the tough guys was I could stand up in class and very rapidly speak sentences into which I could occasionally drop obscenities, but you just couldn't quite hear it. <laughs> <laughs> But the kids could hear it, but the teacher couldn't. And it, and it was this... Uh, <clears throat> Is your first experience with that from so, so that was my scene. But in terms of the relationship to knowledge, I just... Uh, I love... It's what William Blake said, you know. He said, um, attend the minute particulars. And, and that's what's interesting, I think, is... Um, the details of the distinctions among things. I mean, that's why I was a butterfly collector, an art historian, a Tibetan art hound, a rainforest botany person, because what it's all about is the incredible variety of morphological expression in the world. Now, I suppose a Buddhist would recognize this as a serious sangsaric hang-up. You know, that I love the texture of the uh, apparent visible world. It's funny that you ask this question because in my morning meditation this morning, I had this image of a, of a, a work of art, which many of you know, I'm sure. It's Durer's etching of melancholia. And it shows an angel in the foreground and she has the instruments of geometry and there are zoological collections and maps spread out and a, and a orrery of the solar system and she's holding her head and this strange geometric form is beside her. Well, I've put a lot of study into this geometric form and tracing its history and so forth, but that wasn't what caught my attention in the meditation this morning. It was that I, I realized or I recalled that someone had said that this might be a, a medically uh, accurate portrayal of, of migraine and perhaps the earliest because Durer was interested in, the path, in pathology. And then I got the thing for the first time, which was that the angel is, has a, a headache because of the proliferation of of this technological artifactory of all sorts that is spread around. And it's this amazing picture of uh, historical exhaustion. Uh, I don't know how I got off onto that. But anyway, uh, this thing about complexity and appearances, uh, I, 
I, I think the way to get into reality is by running the edges, as I've said. And for me, the entry drug was science fiction, definitely, because that permitted anything. I suddenly got the idea, ha, huh, the imagination sets the parameters. If it will work in your head, that's good enough. You don't have to go further than that. You can build machines, societies, <coughs> organisms, relationships in your head. And if when you run it, the gears turn and the wheels go and it works, then that's it. It works. You don't have to go further than that. And, uh, well, it sort of is working here. I mean, I'm amazed at, at what I'm seeing happening. I mean, I have the feeling that we're just calling it into existence, that it's working. You know, just don't drop the ball, no, don't jinx it, nobody say too much, but we're, it's turning, I can feel it. I mean, it's like turning a battleship with a canoe, but it's turning, you know, and it's enormous, so it's very hard to deflect its momentum. Nevertheless, by holding this point of view, somehow it's working. I've never seen anything like it. I mean, I wouldn't have believed it possible. It's, it is that the world is made of language. And it is that by a certain act of contained concentration, if you are with the Tao, it begins to shed its secret or it begins to open ahead of you. What's that? thing uh, by W.H. Auden about um, a glacier rattles in the cupboard, the desert sighs in the bed, and the crack in the teacup opens a door to the land of the dead. It's that, you know, it is a linguistic structure. You can decondition yourself sufficiently to actually step outside the cultural illusion. It's a breathtaking possibility because nobody knows what's outside the cultural illusion. I mean, you know, Plato got it right. We are chained in a cave watching the flickering shadows of something. But uh, life taken with sufficient seriousness and pushed hard enough at the edges, then this stuff will um, give itself up to you. And it doesn't, it isn't about belief. It isn't about commitment to guru or dogma or method. It's about observational integrity. It's about witnessing and, and, and some kind of primacy of self. In other words, you have to believe that you can tell shit from Shinola. And when you say it's shit and they tell you it's Shinola, you have to vote with your own side, you know. And um, it's very interesting. The, the world is uh, like a labyrinth, or as I said yesterday, it will be mastered by a feat of understanding somehow. It's like a riddle. Yeah. Can you um, give, give some um, uh, advice on how to avoid the pitfalls of mushrooms, the danger of mushrooms? The, um, the supply is irregular for, for those of us who don't have our own botanical garden. Um, from time to time, there are just physical problems. Is there any, any practical advice <coughs> that you could share? Yeah, well, the very best thing is to grow them. And this is, as, this is not as difficult as it's been made out to be. And, you know, the dedication of half of a small closet will uh, get you, your friends, and their friends absolutely smashed. Uh, and the other thing is, I mean, I, I really, I'm serious about urging it. It may sound exotic, but if you want to meet the alien and have a relationship with something very strange that loves you, but that is very, you know, a lot different from a house cat, uh, you should grow this stuff. First of all, it's white as the driven snow. Uh, Melvillian associations aside, there's something to be said for this. 
uh, and then it will take rye, which you buy in a in a health food store for seventeen dollars per hundred pound sack. And it will take rye and it will convert it with a 12% efficiency to dried mushrooms. 12% efficiency to dried mushrooms. I mean, this thing is like, uh, it just wants to enslave itself to you. It will work like a dog. I've never seen anything like it. And uh, it uh, promotes uh, virtues such as Cleanliness, the primary virtue in Western civilization, uh, attention to detail, awareness of scheduling, uh, all these uh, grounding uh, qualities. And then at the end, it will deliver to you, you know, the alien body of the higher and hidden uh, unspeakable. And um, I suppose I should say that my brother and I wrote a book about how to do this, which you can uh, is around. It's not under the name McKenna. We did it pseudonymously. It's called Psilocybin: The Magic Mushroom Grower's Guide. But literally, if you if you want to turn your life into pure science fiction, uh, this is the way to do it, uh, because then you have it, and and it's not it's not the dried stuff that's rubbery that only works half the time that costs an arm and a leg. It's the living quintessence of the thing. And my Lord, I mean, from that point, you know, you are your own Magellan and and need take uh, lessons from nobody because the universe that it opens up to you is is so large that really... You can be confident you'll see things nobody's ever seen before or will ever see again. And technically, it's not that difficult. I mean, it's, it's at a, the level of a hobby. It's a little trickier than canning jam. It's up there with growing sprouts in little trays or culturing yogurt or something like that. Yeah. Can you maybe say a couple of words also about uh, DMT and um, what sort of situation. I haven't had it before and I did it just as a, as a first time how to set it up and maybe and some ideas on where it is. Well, DMT is, you know, regrettably very rare and hard to get. I did notice that the last issue of a magazine called Psychedelic Illuminations that's published in su- Southern California that you can probably get at the Phoenix or the Bodhi Tree published the recipe, published four pages of cam abstract saying... Just in case you were wondering, <laughs> uh, um, a, an interesting phenomenon is going on, which is, uh, we haven't talked about this much this weekend, but briefly it goes like this. As you, many of you probably know, there is a South American hallucinogen called ayahuasca that is orally activated DMT, and it's orally active because it's complexed with a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, in this case, harmine, which comes from a large South American vine called Banisteriopsis capi. Well, hardcore plant psychedelicos all over North America have begun to realize then that this formula, DMT-containing plant plus MAO-inhibiting plant, boiled together, concentrated, gives you some kind of pseudo-ayahuasca. And people are experimenting furiously and, you know, producing ghastly brews and (laughs) amazing stories, uh, and in some cases, actually getting it right. What seems most promising is it was just discovered. Now, here's an example of ethnobotanical progress. It was just discovered about two and a half years ago that a, a plant in the American Midwest called Desmanthus illinoisensis, the Illinois bundleweed, a plant that has no particular folk history or anything, it's just a problem plant on the prairie, uh, has more DMT in the root bark than any plant ever measured on this planet. And no history of human usage, although to me it's suggestive that it's called bundle weed because that suggests medicine bundle. But maybe that's just a coincidence. Anyway, the Indians claim they don't know from it. 
Well, you can take that plant and scrape the root bark, and then there is another plant that grows widely in the American West, and uh, and the seeds of which are sold in Iranian markets all over the country as uh, incense. A, a plant called Pagamon harmala, the giant Syrian rue, and it contains not harmine but harmaline, which actually is a more hallucinogenic. Uh, cogener than harmine. So what people are doing is they're taking pagamon harmala and shredding it and boiling it with desmanthus alanoensis root bark and they're producing a, uh, a North American analog to ayahuasca that works. And w- this is a very interesting development on many levels because it means people are essentially concocting their own unique personalized brews, it also means that probably Pagamon Harmala, which I'm not kidding, in these Iranian markets they call it Hermal, and for six dollars they'll sell you a pound of it, which has enough harmaline in it to flatten your entire apartment house. Uh, uh, Pagamon Harmala, as a source of this MAO inhibiting harmaline, can probably be used to activate all of the DMT-containing plants in the flora of North America, and there are many. There are, uh, first of all, a whole family of grasses, the Phalaris grasses, Phalaris arundinaceae, um, oh, I can't remember, several others. They cause staggers in sheep and uh, are uh, you know, identifiable grasses. There are a number of species of acacia, Acacia confusa contains DMT. Uh, this, there's a plant out in the Central Valley of California that clogs the locks, the, the canal system, that they spend millions of dollars dredging and piling up mountains of this stuff. The root bark of that, Arundo donax, it contains DMT. So people are out there scrambling, and you know, if you were of a witchy turn of mind, this is something to fiddle around with. Uh, There's nothing more satisfying than finding your way to that moment where in your head, you know, it begins to glitter and you realize, you know, it's here, it's here, it worked. Theory and practice in perfect concert has delivered outrage. (laughs) So that's a possibility, yes. Uh, they're, they, they're saying that life on Earth started a lot earlier than they thought. They thought it started like 6 billion years after the Earth stabilized, when it was only like some, uh, 400 million years. And that it was very possibly, one of the ideas they had is that it was started by spores from our space. <laughs> yes. Eventually, you see, this is what I said, that they will come to us because, I mean, that is such an, that's almost like a freebie because it is, you know, all you have to do is like just wake up for a moment and realize that, of course, space is not an an impermeable barrier to life. I mean, it's a tough barrier. But I've been in the Seychelles and in the Hawaiian Islands. These are mid-ocean islands that have been populated by life that has drifted in there. And when you think about the fact that a single Stropheria cubensis mushroom in the sporulation phase, which can last up to three weeks, sheds three million spores per minute for three weeks, one mushroom... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> one mushroom. So, and then you have, you know, the dynamics of the atmosphere. Uh, they pick up off the Antarctic ice shelf uh, chunks of Mars half the size of your head. This is now established that a an asteroidal impact on Mars ejected material into Martian orbit that eventually percolated into Earth orbit. And you know now the way meteorites are prospected for is they eventually put it together that on the Antarctic ice shelf, where the wind is blowing 150 miles an hour most of the year and cutting the ice away, 
that you could fly, and there's no land, what you eventually would get to is the Antarctic Sea, that you can fly over those ice shelves in helicopters with high-powered binoculars, and any black spot is a meteorite or an asteroid fragment because what the hell else could it be, (laughs) you know? And and they've, like, tripled the world's inventory of meteoric material in the last five years through this prospecting technique. They have found a whole box full, like 20 different specimens that they are confident are lunar material, ejecta from from cometary impact on the moon, but two strong candidates for Martian origin. And we're talking about fist-sized donies, you know. So the notion that the percolation of spores and biological material uh, is not possible, I think it will be concluded probably fairly shortly that life originated who knows where and has been percolating out through the universe for a long, long time. Where do you see the place of cannabis in uh, consciousness evolution or whatever? I mean, on the one hand, it, 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 it's obviously doing something like that, but on the other hand, kids do it before they do a drive-by shooting in L.A. And uh, also address maybe the not- notorious uh, effect on memory. Uh, uh, you mentioned that you sometimes do cannabis when you do mushrooms. And my experience is that I don't bring back as much information that I remember when I mix the two together. If you want to hear your comments about that. Yes, well, it's worth talking about cannabis. Uh, I certainly, I don't think I would be who I am if it weren't for cannabis. And it, it hasn't particularly affected my memory. I'm actually the most devoted, on a lifetime scale, the person most devoted to cannabis that I've ever known is myself. I mean, when I lived in Asia, I used to set my alarm for 2 a.m. to smoke because I couldn't go from midnight to 5 and, uh, you know, pe- people thought I was bananas. Uh, in terms of its deleterious effect, I mean, I, it, as I, I think it's pretty, on a scale of the other major drugs of commerce, which would be alcohol, tobacco, and white sugar, I think it comes off as in the best position. Um, I sort of think of it as... Uh, you know, going back to this partnership model about mushrooms in Africa, that when that all dried up and those people were moved into the Middle East and there had been previous waves of migration out of Africa that had established populations in Central Asia. This is why you have like Peking man and Java man. Those are, those are earlier uh, remnants of earlier migrations. Cannabis... Uh, uh, botanically originated north of the Himalayas on the plains of Central Asia. And I think it probably uh, is the best substitute for mushrooms on the cultural level. Uh, it's, it's interesting. See, it was early on. It's one of the oldest domesticated plants. It was early on associated with cordage and fiber. And it's strange that all the words that associate to narrative are also words about weaving. I mean, you weave a story, you unravel a yarn, you, uh, th- you know, thread, unthread a situation, you untangle a situation. It's the parallelism is very old in all European languages, this association uh, between narrative and fiber, which means hemp. So I, I sort of see it as um, the pilot light of Gaian consciousness that was kept going. Now, what people always say to shoot this down is they say, well, but Islam tolerates cannabis, and Islam is hardly the pilot light of Gaian consciousness. Mm, yeah, I mean, it, the, it isn't actually that Islam tolerates cannabis. It's that the Quran expressly forbids alcohol. And then that leaves you to sort it out from there. Uh, I, I certainly think cannabis should be legalized. 
and that if every serious alcoholic were encouraged to be a pothead uh, and to other drug abusers encouraged toward pot, the problem with pot from a societal point of view is that it, it, it is psychedelic enough that, like all psychedelics, it erodes loyalty to cultural values meaning this is the bullshit effect, you know. You just, people say, you know, why don't you get a job? Bullshit, why should I? <laughs> uh, I don't see it implicated in violence. I mean, I think if anything, probably cannabis in, in ghettos is holding down violence as a drug, but probably promoting violence as an item of commerce, and that is because of chuckle-headed laws. I mean, I'm absolutely convinced that the way to solve the drug problem is to remove the profit motive. That's so obvious that I just, it's baffling to me. And society is so schizophrenic on this topic. I mean, the most dangerous drugs are alcohol and tobacco, both fully established in the uh, engines of commerce. Um, it's a bizarre situation and, you know, largely driven by the agenda of Christian fundamentalism in collusion with criminal syndicalists who see this as an opportunity for enormous profit and, uh, you know, cynicism all the way along. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I do find that, um, I mean, I can't smoke a lot of pot because it just... Uh, Unfortunately, I can never become addicted to any drug as much as I try. My body just doesn't tolerate it, but, and I've tried them all more than once. But um, but I do find with pot, I mean, I've had friends who became podcasts who, it wasn't that they betrayed commerce, they lost their ambition. And, you know, and I, I mean, you're very intelligent, and, you you know, you've got a vision, and you're, you know, you're dedicated to your vision, you can pursue it. But, you know, you're a little bit above most average people, but, or different than most average people. Manic is what you're <laughs> yeah, trying to yeah. say. Yes, <laughs> I understand. But, I, mean, mine, I would say, you know, really got lost because of their addiction to pot. And well, so I think that there's more an issue around, it's not about drugs as much as it's about addiction and the issue of addiction. That's right. And how addiction is, you know, individuals become addicted because they're avoiding certain psychological issues that they're, you know, struggling with that, uh, you know, rather than dealing with the issues, they, you know, turn on the TVs. Well, this relates to this larger model we talked about of time, of the war between habit and novelty. The thing that offends people about drugs, and if it doesn't offend you, there's, I think, something wrong with your value system, is to observe unconscious, repetitious, self-destructive behavior. I mean, if that means betting on the ponies or chasing hookers or shooting junk or making bad investments or always blowing your stack with your friends, whatever it is, repetitious self-destructive behavior triggers disgust in the, in the rest of the gang. And uh, drugs, uh, you know, for instance, heroin and tobacco are interesting examples because both they are probably tied for their addictive ability and yet you know to shoot heroin i mean people just turn away aghast it's like you're the lowest of the low cigarette smoking until very recently was tolerated everywhere now what is the difference here the person smoking the cigarette we know that tobacco is tremendously destructive uh that's beyond argument uh, heroin, on the other hand, if you shoot with clean needles and have a steady supply, in other words, if you're not putting in social factors, my God, these junkies live forever. You know, they just pickle themselves and live forever. <laughs> and they don't get sick. So, so, then, but, so then why is it that society is so abhorrent of heroin addiction and so accepting of tobacco addiction? The answer is the presentation of the intoxication when you shoot heroin, first of all, you become very agitated and follow people around raving at them. And then you, if you're an addict, and then, and then you nod. 
And so you drool and your face falls in your plate and your friends have to put you to bed. Uh, tobacco, on the other hand, you know, you can maintain. There is no dramatic uh, sequela of symptoms to betray that, you know, you're completely jacked up and twisted <laughs> around and self-poisoned with this. But there you are at your desk, working efficiently, making phone calls, making money, keeping it all together. So uh, it's the presentation. Then the other thing to say about drugs is that like everything else about us, but even more so, drugs are subject to the genetic her your genetic heritage of drug receptors. And so uh, it's not the same for everybody or even close to the same. I mean, uh, the range of response to drugs can be over several orders of magnitude and can vary throughout your life. So, you know, the fact that I can smoke endless amounts of cannabis and still produce and function it just means that I can. I see people, you know, alcoholics who drink. I mean, if I have more than a drink and a half, I have headaches and I pay my dues. And, you know, to watch somebody go down on a fifth of Stolichnaya, you just realize, you know, this person is a Martian, metabolically <laughs> speaking. I mean, it would just kill me to do that. So uh, this has to do with tolerances and the way the organism can accommodate itself to toxins. But then below that, at bedrock, it actually has to do with genetic uh, proclivities. Yeah. Um, with regard to back to cannabis as a hallucinogen, um, is there a difference in your experience in, in smoking versus ingesting it, uh, eating, uh, eating? Well, that, yeah, that's a good point. See, ha, uh, hashish, or the way cannabis entered the West was as hashish, which was eaten in the 19th century. And if you read the accounts by 19th century savants who, who ate large amounts of hashish, uh, it will convince you, you know, that it was the LSD of the 1870s. I mean, these are m mad intoxications that they are describing. It's not sitting around, you know, seeing the wallpaper move. And, uh, uh, well, they were eating it. Why did cookies and brownies, LSD topos brownies, why did, why did that lose fashion? Is there a danger in it? No, I think when pot went from fifteen dollars a lid to four hundred and seventy-five, people stopped cooking with it. Uh, but let, let me let me say this about uh, about eating hashish. If you're going to do this, I recommend that you eat a red a Lebanese hash if you can, because you see, Lebanese hash is made in a way that people don't really touch it in the same way that charas is made in, in India by people whose uh, hands may not be so clean. And, you know, you're going to take a hit, essentially, of the uh, ambient bacterial population of the village of Hamarubitsar. <laughs> and, you know, your guts will go completely berserk. This is one argument for baking it in a cookie, is to get the pathogens at least smacked down a bit. But if, you, if you've never read Fitzhugh Ludlow's book, The Hashish Eater, Confessions of a Hashish Eater, it's hilarious. I mean, here it is. It's 1852, and he's at Union College in Riverdale, New York. He's been invited to the dean's tea, and, uh, and, and he's just taken this massive hit of cannabis jelly before arriving at the tea. And he says something like, uh, uh, when the umbrellas protruding from the oriental umbrella stand turned into gargoyles, I knew that I must excuse myself, lest I run the risk of betraying my condition. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning, I'm too loaded, I've got to get out of here. <laughs> Lou, um, let me say one more thing about this. There's a wonderful book called Shaman Woman Mainline Lady that is writings by women about drugs. And 
if you want to read something that just will make you roll on the floor with laughter, it's Louisa May Alcott's account of a picnic she and her friends went on with a doctor, somebody or other. And it's just the most insane thing. I mean, it's these incredibly pretentious Victorian femmes uh, with this doctor by this river in the English countryside. And, and uh, it's Lil and Nell and Dolly. And Dolly says... Oh, doctor, we're, we're so exhausted with canasta. Surely you have some new little divertissement that you can share with us. And he says, well, Dolly, uh, I do have uh, this, uh, this uh, little case of uh, the best Moroccan hashish bonbons from Paris. And they say, oh, my. and then it, and it's, it's madness. I mean, uh, it, it's just the most extraordinary thing. Um, yes. <laughs> Does cannabis, cannabis work on the brain or chemically? Does it stop? Or? It's not very well understood. Uh, there is a receptor, uh, but cannabis is not an alkaloid. Cannabis is technically a polyhydric alcohol, uh, which makes it a chemically unique type. It's also bot botanically unique. Cannabis, it's what's called a monotypic genus. In other words, uh, these three species, Ruteralis, Sativa, and Indica, which are all obviously speciated within historical time and can, by chromosomal studies, be shown to be all derivatives of Rusula, the Central Asian wild type, uh, it has no near relatives. Uh, and so it's, it's unique and it's not well understood. As far as somebody asked about using it psychedelically, I think that the real, and I can't say I do this because I need it for other reasons, but in terms of the pure psychedelic issue, the way to do cannabis is once a week in silent darkness, alone, with the best stuff you can get, and then just, you know, do as much of it as you can possibly do in as short a time and sit with it you will every single time be absolutely torn to pieces by it, you know. I mean, it is just astonishing. The problem is that people get into it, myself included, for other reasons than that hallucinogenic uh, uh, flash. But that would really be the ideal way. And also it would prove you were a person of great rectitude and self-control <laughs> if you could do that. Yeah. Um, in one of your books, um, you mentioned the idea of a nostalgia for paradise um, as part of uh, perhaps the collective unconscious. Um, and maybe that was formed during the psilocybin paradise period. Mm -hmm. um, do you see um, in, the, in 2012 um, us having to uh, abandon that, or uh, will it be fulfilled by that? Well, this phrase, nostalgia for paradise, I, I don't know who invented it. When I, I first encountered it in Merciliad's book, uh, Cosmos and History, which if you've never read this book, it's a little book. It was one of the most influential books on my thinking because I saw there a whole different way of talking about uh, uh, spiritual reality. Uh, but I disagree with Iliad that it is uh, simply a, a attitude in the human mind. I really think there was a, a fall and that this is a diminished condition and that there was some kind of cohesion that we do have this nostalgia for. That's why I think our whole relationship to drugs is all about the fact that I mean, look here. Here's the metaphor. Uh, we're like the children of an abused relationship. Something was taken from us 15,000 years ago. It was 
the thing which kept us in balance with each other, with the earth. It kept us in our imaginations, in the poetic world of natural magic. And then it was taken from us. And it was a big downer. And life turned into history and warfare and subjugation and classism and all of these things. And... Uh, and the thing that was taken from us was, was this intoxication. And so then we moved on to alcohol, to money, to opium, uh, because that was very big in the Minoan phase. I mean, opium had a huge influence on Minoan civilization. Uh, and all of these things, an effort to scratch an itch that you can never quite reach and, but in the meantime, all kinds of addictions, wars, criminal syndicates, horrible things go on. Uh, now, in the 20th century, through the science of anthropology, a complete inventory, essentially, is taken of the world's uh, intoxicating possibilities. It's part of a complete inventory of the world's people, languages, technologies, uh, belief systems that characterizes anthropology. But there it is. In 1953, Gordon Wasson returns from the village of Watla de Jimenez in the Sierra Mazateca, and he has the body of Eros, you know, pickled in a jar, lost since the fall of Minoan Crete, but suddenly restored. And then nobody knows what to make of it, and the CIA looks at it, and Hoffman looks at it, and... Uh, and now it is found, I think, and uh, I don't know if it comes too late or if the final irony is that we learn what it was all about but nevertheless have to succumb to the momentum of our own stupidity. In other words, it's some kind of Greek drama where you have this horrible realization and fully understand the whole bit, but you're doomed anyway just because it makes for better theater, or whether it is the, you know, the, preferred, the happy ending of the Christian eschaton. Uh, yeah. Uh, two questions. I want to know. <laughs> what the ninth century's best tools were uh, for cognizing these kinds of matters were... Uh, scholastic theology, and I, I've been accused of that, been accused of that. Uh, <clears throat> so what scholastic theology says is that there is something called uh, the nunc stands, the, the, the eternal now, and that somehow, well, it, this all goes back to this wonderful thing which Plato said. Plato said, time is the moving image of eternity. And uh, my notion of what this is all about is that the time wave we looked at last night is, is eternity. It's the fractal structure of the temporal module viewed from a higher dimension. And then time is the traversing of that thing. The nature of the singularity is hard to anticipate. If you use the old fractal principle of ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, do you all understand what that means? It, it's the phenomenon of that a fetus, as it develops, ontogeny, recapitulates the evolutionary history of life on the earth. That's uh, phylogeny. In other words, the, the fetus is first a little kind of a thing, an amoeboid mass of cells, and then it becomes sort of like a salamander, and then it becomes like a... a you know, a, a primitive mammal and so forth and so on. Well, using that principle to try and anticipate the end state seems legitimate in the fractal, under the fractal dispensation. However, it leads to the conclusion that when you look at an organism, what happens to all organisms is that they die. So then does that, that leaves you with the conclusion that what happens at the end date of the of the the whole enchilada is the equivalent of some kind of mass dying. Well, then that really doesn't tell you much because we don't know what dying is, you know. We don't know whether that means that how can the ultimate novelty be complete extinction? It must be then that we have to overcome as positivists our phobia 
against this area of speculation previously presided over by beady-eyed priests and actually take it back and say that in the mysteries of metabolism and morphology, it is perhaps now necessary to entertain the idea that death is not a nihilistic release into non-entity and that instead the shamanic model is correct and that biological life is a sojourn into matter and that at death, you know, you do go to some incomprehensible unfoldment, only the first moments of which can be made sense of because I really think the DMT thing is like bungee cording into the bardo. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, there you go. And then just as you uh, it jerks you back. And, uh, and so you get that much of a look into the yawning grave. And I take it as, uh, it's strange, yes, but surely reason for hope and optimism uh, how much of oneself, whatever that means, is going to be carried over? It, I don't know, but it looks to me like probably not much. And and that, but what lies ahead is well, to, to quote uh, Bilbo Baggins, uh, <laughs> the greatest adventure still lies ahead. I'm pretty convinced of that, uh, which surprises me because I'm a cynic, and a and a you know. I'm not easily swept into optimism. <laughs> My, yeah. Well, you just had a, a great little pre-echo your uh, analogy with scholastic theology lets us know what is going to be the defining event of 2012. The collected works of uh, Terence McKenna are published under the title Summa Mycologica. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. <clears throat> yeah. Um, what what cautions and reservations do you advocate in like this this dance with Kali? And I, I mean, we we talk about the revival of the Bible, and and sometimes I wonder if we remember what we're talking about. And that, that in this in this possible great ecstasy there lies many horrors. Some danger. Yeah, I, I guess I'm I'm conscious. I, I'm constantly asking that question as I have uh, taken. A four and a half year break from drugs and moving back in that direction and having consumed some mushrooms recently and, and wanting to, like, in this revival of, of, of the use of these substances, I feel like a need to be absolutely reverent and to, uh, and to be sensitive to, um, to what I'm doing. Well, there, the danger, I mean, as I see it, and I feel it very strongly, and I don't, you know, the danger is, uh, just to put it out there, is madness. I mean, we talk about stretching the envelope, we talk about running the edge, but you don't want to rip the envelope. You don't want to island yourself in a situation where nobody can make sense out of what you're saying. And yet, that's the game we play, is always pushing. So what you said about reverence and absolute impeccability of attitude, and also I think it's very important to be physically together. You know, I mean, I, it's important to be physically together anyway. I go to a gym three days a week, and I think of it as pre- preparation for psychedelic Voyaging, because if your body is a clean instrument, uh, you can do it. The other thing is uh, technique. I mean, in the psychedelic state, if there are problems, there are techniques to deal with them. The best technique, and uh, Western people don't um, naturally gravitate toward this, but if, if you get into a place you don't like on a psychedelic, uh, sing. You must sing. Uh, Most people's tendency is to clench. This is very bad because it can just grind you to nothing. What you have to do is you have to sit up and you have to sing, and it doesn't really matter what you sing. You will find the song. I mean, start out with row, row, row your boat and go from there. 
Uh, and uh, the other thing is, you know, the real issue I find in myself is surrender. That it's all very fine to sit here getting paid dollars per minute extolling this stuff, but boy, is it different to do it. You know, you can talk all you want, but um, the the thing is so, I don't know if scary is the word, but it's such a, it's so total what happens, and you're so vulnerable, and you know that if there is any flaw, if there is any flaw in your approach or attitude, that that flaw will be magnified by the stress of the thing and become highly problematic. So it's all about asking the question, you know, am I ready? Now, this is not, a, this is not how, how beginners approach it, nor should they. It's incredibly forgiving of, uh, of first, second, and third timers. But as it takes you in, what it gives is a certain measure of, for want of a better word, let's call it power. And the payback on that existential validity would be another way of calling it rather than power. The payback on that existential validity is that you have to be okay and you know maybe it's my catholic upbringing or something but one cannot do the examination of conscience carefully enough because there is there's always flaw so it's about you know staying right with it it teaches the right way to live and also surrender that's why i don't ever have an agenda i regard having an agenda as as essentially aspiring to be a magician of some sort. And I don't. I don't. I want to witness it. I am perfectly content to be present at the miracle. I don't want to do the miracle, and I don't want the miracle to be done to me. I just want to, to be there. Uh, Frank Herbert, in his book Dune, said something which over the years I've found, though it sounds flimsy to say, it actually works, you, some of you may recall that in that book, they had this drug called Strune, and it did pull you out through time. It was not just a drug. It, it revealed, like I'm saying psilocybin and DMT do, uh, the real structure of reality. And in there, they discuss what do you do about the fear that comes with the, the gigantic, awesome dimensions of this vision. Uh, and he says... Uh, or someone tells uh, the main character, fear is like a wind, and it blows through the mind. And what you must do is you must wait. And it cannot sustain itself unless you give it an object. And uh, this is actually true, I found, that fear, whatever it is cognitively, Physiologically, it's a chemical wave of release of adrenaline. And what you do is you just sit and watch it come like a bell curve and then recede, and then you're still on the surface of the ocean and the power of it has been defeated. But if you, if you give it any object to cling to, you know, it will break white water and then the chaos will overwhelm you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. About the difference between um, psilocybin and ayahuasca experiences. And I'm particularly interested, I heard you talk once about how the value of those <clears throat> value in you know, the psilocybin experience and more technological and you know, get ready to depart the planet kind of value. Whereas ayahuasca is more save the planet. Feminine. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. Somebody once said to me after they took a mushroom trip, they said, I don't think I'll do that anymore. And I said, why not? And they said, because I'm not interested in insects that drive spaceships. Uh, <coughs> uh, which are, sums up psilocybin pretty well. Uh, it, psilocybin is Apollonian and hortatory and grandiose. And it's interesting that they have these personalities. I mean, psilocybin is, is kind of megalomanic. 
I mean, it says, history is ending, prepare for the departure, the crisis of the species is upon us, cosmic forces are intersecting, machines the size of Manitoba will be involved, and, and it's all about, you know, mankind prepare to depart for the higher orders of the galactarian hegemony and this whole thing like that. And ayahuasca is all about how rivers flow and family lines intersect and what is in the river and what is in the mind of the woman and what is... It's like this very sensual telepathic gas which spreads out when you're in the rainforest and brings you into connection with everything. It's also, it doesn't speak. It's, you, it becomes like uh, the eye of a camera. Its language is entirely a visual language. It never speaks. It just shows you, showing, showing, showing. After a good ayahuasca trip, you feel like your eyes are falling out. I mean, you have been looking, literally looking with full attention for hours at this stuff with this, you know, this... Um, sense of it being distanced from you somehow. No, it's a little puzzling because uh, DMT is the uh, psilocybin in brain in the metabolic pathway doesn't actually become DMT, but it's about as close as it could possibly be. So the difference is quite startling. Um, and and then, then DMT when smoke not when taken in the ayahuasca situation where you get what I just described, but when smoked, like it trumps the psilocybin. It goes so far beyond it because it carries you into the part where you can understand. The other one, the psilocybin communicates at least in human terms. I mean, apocalyptically, mega, technically, through these science fiction metaphors and so forth. But the, the, the DMT flash goes beyond that and you say, this is truly the presence of an alien mind. This is not being filtered for my consumption at all. This is absolutely uh, just off the wall, whatever it is. Yeah. That's right. So it's puzzling that the route of administration and the complexing with the MAO inhibitors gives it these different psychological tones because I think almost everybody who's experienced these things would agree with what I said about these aspects of the personalities of the of the substances. No, LSD is different. LSD is like psychoanalytical Drano. It's not a personality. It's a, uh, you mean the morning glory seeds and I've only taken those things five or six times in my life and all in my youth and I remember the visions. I remember the hallucinations. Uh, once on Hawaiian Woodrows, on Argeria Nervosa, I entered into an entire world based on the theme of the sea urchin. And I was in these cathedral-like vaulted spaces, which were the insides of sea urchins. And then there was this coach that was pulled by by these very strange-looking animals, and it had these nipple-like protuberances all over it and everything was done in mauve and purple and white and it was just sea urchin world for about 20 minutes and then that went away. Could you explain, um, and I know this gets back to a basic premise and what we've been talking about the last couple of days, but elaborate a little more on why you conclude that these hallucinations are in fact true hallucinations. In other words, why do you conclude that these alpha-like entities really exist? Well, really exist. True enough. We we talked about that, didn't we? About the Wittgensteinian thing, did we? Yes. yes. They're true enough because they have efficacy. You see, uh, we miss the point because we think the world is made of matter. Matter is simply a concept. The world is made of language. And since the hallucinations communicate in language, 
they are as they are as real as anything else. They are helping make reality. Uh, the, it's crazy to think that the universe is made of quarks and mu mesons and neutrinos and stuff like that. I mean, who here has ever seen one or has the, even the most specious grasp of how you would go about looking for such a thing? But we get exposed to those words. The world is really made of language, of interlocking concepts. Well, so then that means that the hallucinations are real. That in that sense where Mia Farrow says in Rosemary's Baby, my God, this is actually happening, that's what needs to happen inside the psilocybin trip. We have this category called hallucination or intoxication or trance, and then we say, oh, it's only mental, and therefore it's not real. Well, I've got news for you. It's all mental. And therefore, it is real. And the, and the big news is that while we've been waiting for aliens to come in ships from the stars, we have totally overlooked the alien nature of reality around us. And that by pushing into these mental dimensions, we discover a bewildering uh, fauna of... Uh, angels, demons, helping spirits, ancestor spirits. I don't, I only speak from my own uh, experience. So, for instance, I'm unable to pass judgment on something like voodoo uh, or, or uh, I, you know, tantric invocation or something like that. But I would, I, using reason was able to confirm the existence of things that no reasonable person believes in. And, you know, this is impressive. And it's repeatable. That's the thing I want to stress. This is not some faith or something where you have to, you know, I don't know. It's just that it's a technology. It's a technology of ethnopharmacology. Obviously, the experience is repeatable, but what that experience means and whether it... it indicates some, for lack of a better phrase, objective reality separate and apart from your mind is, is not necessarily proven by having, having the experience itself. Yes, but see, it's difficult to prove that there's any objective reality apart from your mind anyway. Yeah, I mean that, but but it's it's not only it don't not only rests on Berkeley, which is an earlier version of it, but it also rests now on quantum physics' need to include the observer into the equation. Somehow there is a something, which the which the vectors of which are collapsed into the experience of the here and now by the observational act, and then the role of language in this. I mean, this is. It's not easy to sort this stuff out. Uh, if you want to read an interesting book, read Despanet's book, The Philosophical Foundations of Quantum Mechanics. This will give you something to chew on for sure. So, somebody, yeah. Oh, that it, well, that it has no character? or And by character, I meant personality. I didn't mean to diss it. I just meant... It doesn't organize itself around uh, a personality the way psilocybin does. I found LSD to be like a conceptual enhancer. It was great for looking at things and for thinking about things. And uh, but I also, and this may be my my, and obviously is my personal thing. I found it just physically incredibly hard on my body. I mean, my God, the next day I would lay in warm baths and try and sort it all out. And that seemed, and I was taking good LSD, I mean, Sandoz LSD. So uh, I, for me, when I got to psilocybin, I was just exultant. Because see, what I had done is I'd read Huxley, then I'd gone back to Havelock Ellis, The Dance of Life, and Henri Michaud, The Miserable Miracle, and people like that. And Havelock Ellis talks about ruined buildings of great antiquity drooping with opalescent jewels and protruding from Venusian forests. And I said, that's 
what I'm after, you know. And LSD would never even approach that. It was much more mechanical and elusive and fast-moving. Well, then when I took psilocybin, lo and behold, it was just like Havelock Ellis, produced and directed by Havelock Ellis. Uh, And that is what I love. It may just be a prejudice of mine, but to me, the, the... transcendental uh, part of it is the visions because thoughts you can have and even insights you can have but to have behind your darkened eyelids a huge technicolor movie going on for minutes and minutes stunning in its cohesion and beauty and architectonic triumphal I mean you just say wow this is Great, this is great. Who's doing this? And and the thing, if you appreciate it like that, it will say, oh, you, you think that's something? Look at this. And then it starts trying to impress you. And you say, yes, do it. Just take me. I'm yours. Go, go, go. <laughs> yes. Could you say something about the uh, information that's revealed through the drug-induced state and dreams? Oh, good question. Uh, I think that it, that perhaps dreaming is, you know, that perhaps every night we go as deep as these psychedelic drugs take us. There's, but there's something about, um, there's apparently very little short-term or long-term memory trace laid down mm. by these experiences. I think if we would just legalize these things and turn our creative science people loose on this, uh, what we really need is a drug that allows you to remember your dreams. That's it. And pardon me. Well, we have the concept and we have claims, but I mean one that will work for me. <laughs> yes, that's uh, that's a good point. The one argument that I feel the force of against cannabis is that. Uh, it completely suppresses dreaming. I well, it's it's debatable. My I think that because it's a boundary dissolver, that I have sort of a pressure theory of dreams, and that somehow cannabis depressurizes the dream place because you deal with this material in active fantasy. But boy, if you stop smoking. If you're a regular cannabis user and you stop smoking, within 48 hours you will have dreams that will have you on the phone to mother. I mean, (laughs) and it goes on and on. Uh, I stopped smoking cannabis about a year and a half ago for four months. And uh, these, what finally sent me back to it is the dreams convinced me I was losing my marbles and then (laughs) enough of making a point, you know. had and, and it was accessible to my rational mind. It was like my rational mind was in place enough to know that I had and dreamt it and that I was re dreaming and absolutely recollecting and reliving the dream state and you know, the previous dreams that I had really? in the last like, month or so. And where were these Amanitas from? Uh, Michigan. And and what other what were the other symptoms like? Were, did you feel cold? Um, uh, threw up about ten times, but that was you know it was okay. Did you hallucinate? It was totally as though I was dreaming. Uh huh. Really, I was just absolutely immersed. I was catatonic. I mean, I did not move. Bird. Well, that's very interesting. I mean, uh, uh, we didn't talk much about Amanita muscaria. Amanita muscaria is a very mysterious because uh, it, it is so variable over its range. Uh, it's chemic, you know, it, it's seasonally variable, genetically variable, uh, geographically variable, and so it's the you hear once in a while an amazing Amanita story. Most Amanita stories are that it's toxic and horrible, but maybe one in 15 stories will be something just wonderful like this. And it's, 
I'm convinced that you know it, it has to do with some very subtle chemical equilibrium that people find and lose. And probably when Amanita shamanism was flourishing, it was a case of where you really did have to go to a master to sort out how to do it without wasting your time or poisoning yourself. I really did initially think I was dying. I mean, I knew I was being poisoned, and, but it was all right. I had willfully entered into it with the sense that I wanted a death. Not a physical death per se, but I wanted to experience the Bardot. Uh-huh. And, and so it was like a willingness to be, you know, to, to feel poisoned. And so, you know what I mean? It wasn't a negative thing. It was something that I had willfully sought. And was it the muscarinic poisoning, chills and salivation? Yeah. And, uh-huh, uh-huh. But it was okay. I mean, it was just because it, it was as though I had accepted total responsibility that that was a willful act on my own part. And so it didn't look as, you know, like... No, I... I would say, you know, what is death? I mean, to me, you can look at, is death birth or is death... Death, and and it was as though I was participating in a birthing. I mean, it was just I focused on that aspect of it, and so I was not merely dying. I was birthing myself, and and so it didn't have the negative. Um, I didn't get ill by it. I mean, uh huh. I understand. I'm up and I'm sick. It's I'm not. You know, it's as though another LSD trip I had just previous a few weeks before that was I had all these energies, you know, just hitting me and, and the idea was this voice just kept saying, pick and choose, anyone to you. And so it became very really apparent that you could get paranoid and just indulge in that aspect, my God, I'm dying and, and Yeah, well the ego this is what the ego tells you as its last desperate right. ploy. Yeah. Uh let me say to the group, as far as Amanita and Muscaria is concerned, don't try this at home, folks. <laughs> uh, I mean, this it's, you, you know, out there on the edge of the bardo. I think, though, I mean, I hear what you're saying. If you're truly psychedelic, uh, the difference between living and dying is quite immaterial. Uh, no pun intended. Uh, but it's a but, you know, do you want, do you manifest it in your mind or are you languaging the sense this is death, I'm dying, dying, dying? Or do you just transmute it and you say, this is death, I'm, I'm being born, I'm being born, I'm being born, and, and you manifest the reality. I mean, that's whether you are dying, actually, or whether you're being born. I mean, it's kind of almost the same thing. Yeah, this is the issue of surrender because boundary dissolution is interpreted by the ego as death. And if the boundary dissolution is happening rapidly or for some reason in an alarming fashion to the ego, it will pull out this explanation. And then you really have to discipline the hind brain and say, you know, no, this is what we chose to do. This is the course we're set on. And this is the course we're sailing. Uh, because, you know, what are you going to do? Um, how has taking the drug you've taken over the years affected your uh, familial relationships and your life generally in terms of your happiness? That's what it is. Well, it's hard to say, you know, because you ask about a path not taken as well as a path taken. Um, all the women I've ever been with were heads of some sort, uh, of varying and lesser degrees. Uh, I was married for 15 years. We're separated. Um, I don't, I don't see the drugs as a particular issue. Uh, Although my wife used to complain that I spent a great deal of time sort of out of the flow of family life and loaded. But on the other hand, I remember when I was eight and nine years old, huge scenes with my father and my mother because they were always going off on picnics or something and I always wanted to stay home and read. So it was exactly the same pattern before drugs appeared in my life. I've always been 
I, I like to do things by myself a lot. Um, I, I think uh, um, I was, I mean, cannabis for me was really a turning point. I remember the first time I smoked cannabis and I realized, aha, I can be a normal person with this stuff. I can self-medicate myself and I can stop being this incredibly hyperactive, nervous, yammering, skinny, bespectacled, Ichabod-like creature that I was. And and then, I don't know, I mean, I leave it to you to judge the result, but uh, my impression was that it helped with that. That I and it helped with my social relations because I was always so alienated and uh, and uh, peculiar. Uh, but my life has been so totally about drugs that I can't imagine it any other way. One of the things that most horrified me when I stopped smoking cannabis, and I've I had always said it about cannabis, was uh, you worry. You worry. People who don't smoke cannabis worry. Now, they would say that they're tending to business and that that's part of being an adult. But most worry is superfluous and preposterous. And, you know, if I don't smoke pot for a week, I become very attentive to stuff like balancing my checkbook, (laughs) receipts, get deeply into receipts, uh, and just all this weird stuff, you know, and I start thinking, you know, gee, uh, is my medical insurance paid up? Or uh, I, uh, you know, I should prepay my taxes and uh, all this kind of thing. Uh, Now, I suppose to go too far in the other direction, you would just be a complete space case. But my life seems to function very well, and people say I have an abnormally neat apartment, so I don't think I'm, I'm letting down too much. Uh, but anxiety is, uh, is a very dubious thing, I think, and anything that assuages that, as long as it doesn't sedate you, is probably a pretty, a pretty good thing. Your presence makes me think it's not as eccentric as it probably actually is. So I appreciate your contributing to my own delusional uh, state. I hope you found this information interesting. Uh, You know, avoid gurus, follow plants. It's like Van Morrison says, no guru, no method, no teacher. Just you and me and Mother Nature in the garden in the garden, wet with rain. So thank you very much.